with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court, your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the entry of the commission's decision. We advise that you seek your own independent legal advice to assure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met. So I move for a approval of the agenda for today's agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? Mr. Yes. This is Teresa Costonis. Oh, um, do we need to put the uh, thing in there about the state of emergency? Yes, sir. Okay, where is that? Uh, the Okay, motion to comply with the governor's executive order 16 regarding electronic meetings. The items on the meeting agenda constitute essential business of this body and meeting electronically is necessary to protect the health safety and welfare of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 outbreak. Mr. Chairman, this is Councilmember O'Connell and I will move the above. Okay, we have a, a motion on our electronic meeting. Is there a second? This is Sarah Lee Woods, I uh, second. It's in the second, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Seeing none opposed, the motion to comply is approved. I, I move to get a motion to approve today's agenda. This is Nora Curran, so moved. Okay. Is there a second, please? Sarah Lee Wood, second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. The agenda has been approved. Approval of the minutes of the June 22nd, 2020 meeting of the Parking Commission. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Or did everyone get a copy of the minutes? Did Mr. Chair, this is Council Member O'Connell and I move approval. We have a motion to approve. Is there a second? Sarah Lee. Kern, I second. Hey, Nora Kern, second. First and a second. Mr. Chairman, this is Teresa Costonis again. I apologize for interrupting. No, I, yes. I did look at the minutes and I did notice that the, the motion that was just made regarding the essential business and the, the state of emergency, um, I did not see that in the minutes. And I okay. believe that that was adopted at the last meeting. I you believe know? that it was. So, uh, Mr. O'Connell, since you had made the motion to approve the minutes, can you make a motion to approve with that? Uh, yes, I will update my motion to incorporate the suggested edit from legal, please. So we have a first. Ms. Kern, or will you second? I will update my second, yes. Okay, we have a first and a second. Thank you, Ms. Costunas, for keeping us legal. Uh, is there all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The minutes have passed. Okay. <laughs> Approval of the consent agenda. Please note that items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. Are there any items of note on the consent agenda that people wish to remove or discuss? Ms. Um, Woods. This is Commissioner Woods. I'd like to discuss the parking meter removal situations and the fees for ballet. Okay, that would be item A and B, I think. Is that correct? Yes, yes I'd like to move those out of the consent to okay. separate items to discuss. Okay. So if you would make a motion, please. I make a motion that items A and B be removed from the consent agenda. Is there a second? I'll make a second, this is Nora Kern. All right, there's a second. All in favor of removing those two items, say aye. 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 Mr. Chairman, this yes. is Betsy. Could yes. we have that agenda put up on the screen, please? Okay. Can you do that, uh, Miss uh, the legal technical person, please? 
Ms. I think it's Ms. Johnson, the host. Uh, yes, give me one second. Diane, would you actually uh, want to be the presenter to put that on the screen? Let's, let's use Corby, if you don't mind. Corby, you got your agenda? Yeah, I have, I have it. The reason I say that, Ms. Johnson, is because he's got the uh, mandatory referral handouts if we need it. No, it works. I'm passing him presenter now. Can everyone see that, please? And, yeah, can everyone see that? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Chair. Yes. Okay. Can you see that, Ms. Williams? Can you? Yes, I can. Okay. All right. So the motion to remove is to remove the item A and B. Item A relates to a ballet stand, and item B relates to the removal of six parking spaces, parking meter spaces. Mr. Chair, can I ask one more technical question? Um, we have a commissioner, our commissioner Gilliland is on phone only. Okay. Johnson, and and if you is it working mike yeah I, actually i've got it on the computer now too can you hear me yes okay we were exchanging text so we're good sorry about that all right great okay so i think we had a first and a second to remove item a and b were you ready to is there a Approval to remove these two items, please, and then we'll discuss them after the rest of the consent agenda. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Are there any other items on the consent agenda that people want to discuss separately, please? Okay, if not, then we'll, I'll read the modified consent agenda and ask for approval. Item C, authorized speed limit reduction on Neely's Bend Road from Gallatin Pike to Dead End at Peeler Park from 40 miles per hour to 35 miles per hour requested by council member Hancock. Item D, authorize a speed limit reduction on Cottonport Drive from Cloverland Drive to Dead End from 30 miles per hour to 25 miles per hour requested by a resident. Item E, a request for the abandonment of a portion of Union Street and Rosa Parks Avenue right away in easement at the northeast corner of Union Street and Rosa L. Parks Avenue requested by Barge Cawthon and Associates applicant. Item F, request for the abandonment of the right of way and easements along an unnumbered alley from alley number 540 eastward to 14th Avenue North, approximately 140 feet north of Buchanan Street, requested by Centric Architecture applicant, Buchanan Partners LAC, LLC and Buchanan Partners 2 owners. Item G, a request for the abandonment of the right of way and easement for a portion of an unnumbered alley located off of Center Street North with approximately 125 feet along the southeast property line of parcel 0560500330 requested by Margie Russell owner. The consent agenda has been read. Is there a motion to approve? Uh, you have your hands up. 
Move to approve. Okay. Who's that? Was that? Commissioner Woods. Okay. Is there a second? Second, Mrs. O'Connell. Okay, we have a first and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. The remaining item of the consent agenda is modified, has been approved. Okay. Back to item number A. Authorize the valet zone at one music square west for Virgin Hotel requested by Premier Parking. Mr. Knopf, can you give us, or Ms. Marshall, give us background on this request, please? Okay, can you hear me? The zone is located on the west side of Music Square West, between 17th Avenue South and Roy Acuff Place. It's a 24-7 valet zone. Uh, this is Commissioner Woods. Question, please. Hi. Uh, okay. My question is, I noticed that um, uh, that there is on our agenda, um, we have an update on a uh, ballet operations at the end of the meeting under other business, uh, uh, other under items, sorry. Is it possible to wait and vote on this? I mean, we're, you know, I know we're being educated about what all this means or is this all we need to know? I, I'm going to jump in and say, I, from a standpoint of discussion here, I agree with Commissioner Woods. I mean, I I absolutely affirm the need for the version to have a valet zone here, and I'm sure it was incorporated in the original project plans. But I know one of the concerns that I and clearly other commissioners had was that we are we have been uh, increasingly off in our fee process for valets and I'd love to get that update uh, as well before we authorize another valet. I hey, Mr. Chair, I would suggest I moving this one to the heel and seeing if we can come back to it after we get that presentation. I agree. Ms. Costonis, I assume we can vote on this later in the meeting. Is that correct? Yes, I don't think there would be any reason that you couldn't from a legal perspective. Right. Well, we'll discuss that later. Item B, which was to authorize removal of six phase parking meter zone on the east side of Orberton Street near 901 Division Street for the construction of the Nashville canopy requested by Reagan Smith Associates. So this were six paid parking meters, is that correct staff? That is correct. And the reason why they're requesting these meters to be removed is because they need it for site circulation and also for a southbound left turn lane at the intersection with Division Street. Okay, so I'm, I, I'm I just, guess yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Commissioner Woods. Commissioner Woods, I'm, I'm just a guesstimate. Do we know how much revenue the city is uh, going to lose uh, because of this? I'm, you know, we're all being, you know, asked to be cognizant of the city budget. So just asking a question there. I'm going to give a rough guess estimate of approximately a thousand dollars annually. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Chair, this is uh, yep. Councilmember O'Connell. I, I guess um, I know we mostly discussed the provision that would allow valet stands to potentially um, that application process to incorporate mm -hmm. uh, that lost revenue in some way. I don't know about other meter. I might ask Ms. Costonas to just quickly weigh in on that and, and whether any of the existing Metro code laws speaks to just meter removal generally, especially when uh, it is in conjunction with development. I, don't, I know we have a provision under valet. Do we have a generalized pr provision there? Um, not that I'm aware of council member. Um, I, I believe it's certainly clear that only the commission can designate meter spaces and, and therefore undesignate them. Um, but um, 
other than the, the specific provision with regard to um, kind of converting them to valet spaces, um, there is not a similar provision that I'm aware of that would be more generally applicable. Um, certainly in the, um, uh, the loading and unloading zone context, um, there is not, although that is a little bit getting into the presentation that we're going to be making at the under, under other business. Right. And I guess that's uh, I, part of me thinks that this prompts again, the, I know Mr. Chair, as I was joining the commission, um, last year, one of the things that you had already begun was, was kind of advancing some of the threads of conversation that had originated in the, uh, the, the privatized parking modernization proposal that came up. Um, and I think we might want to look at um, this not just in the context of Valet. I think if we are, if we're looking at a, a process whereby a private development is, um, you know, making infrastructure changes that are going to result in meter removal, then we might want to uh, examine something there also on the um, that 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 revenue scenario, right? Because this is this is not even going to generate the the bare minimum of the fifty dollar valet application. This is basically just going to alter the traffic flow for that area, which will make sense when the project is complete. But um, you know, I mean, it is this is this is a removal of a public revenue source. So we just need to be sensitive to that. I think what I would like to ask, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, this is Commissioner. Yes. Uh, I learned a lot, you know, from what we went through before about any talk of privatization, which I certainly appreciate, but I, I'm not sure that, um, the, the public works and Metro itself has been given the authority to look or to see what they can do about increasing this. You know, if we're going to start giving away meter space, uh, at least seeing if we can generate more revenue for the city, uh, that I, I feel confident public works, you know, can collect, there can be some kind of, some, somebody in Metro can collect that. Uh, but I wish we could get some kind of direction from uh, the powers that be about that. Well, and to Commissioner Woods's point, you know, different types of applications to the planning department have different types of fees. And maybe what we need to be in a position to do is, you know, introduce something that is effectively a per meter fee if you are going to be applying to remove existing parking meters, something like that. Yeah, I, I think something along that line makes sense. If you're removing revenue, you know, what, what, what's the exchange? Is there going to be a bus stop going there, for example, or any other kind of trade-offs? Is uh, Well, and you can make an indirect argument that the improvements to the site, uh, yeah. once that development is done, yes, we will see um, very likely significantly uh, increased property tax revenue. But again, I mean, from a public works standpoint, we are changing that streetscape. So, um, and uh, you know, again, this, the same is true for both of these two, because these are both district 19 projects. I'm very familiar with both locations and, and broadly supportive of the overall proposals. But, you know, from the big picture standpoint, one of the things that we've been grappling with since, you know, frankly, before I joined the commission is, we know that a lot of our policies around um, the way our, our entire meter and valet system works are both out of date from a fee structure standpoint, but I think also, you know, um, maybe out of date from how uh, there just, there wasn't a, a period in Nashville's history where we saw so much growth along corridors that might have required the removal of meters. So we just, there are some things that, um, probably weren't taken into account when this piece of the code was originally updated. And I think this, again, COVID slowed a lot of um, 
procedural things down, but I think where I'd like to get to, um, you know, within the next several months is a recommendation to uh, update this section of the Metro Code of Laws that is uh, recommended by this commission. Is that possible to do? Can we ask our legal counsel uh, what the commission can do? Can definitely do it. I think I had been hoping that we would get enough insights from, um, you know, the the studies that are underway that we might then turn that into something. I mean, you know, if if we were operating in maybe a, a less fiscally constrained standpoint, this is exactly the kind of place where I would look to, um, you know, a a consultant to help us think through some of the options and then we would work with legal to draft up um, a proposed package of updates to the metro code of laws um, you know it sounded as though the the fee study on ballet did have some capacity to work with a, a consulting vendor um, and i don't know if that is you know i mean chip might be able to speak to whether or not we have some additional capacity and whatever contracts are available but that's that's to me the long-term play here is we have some sensible discussion around uh you know a series of potential updates we might make that run us through all of this stuff meter removal valets and how it inter interacts with meter removal um you know uh just generally everything within our remit and and I'll I'll complicate it even further, Councilman. Um, a lot of these things you see in front of you come from the Planning Commission. Um, there are conditions on development that that you guys, unfortunately, probably aren't even aware of. You probably are as a council person, but you know. I knew, for instance, this one was coming, but you know, and I I recognize right that sometimes we're trying to do things or bringing us into compliance with the major and collector street program and all that kind of stuff. And sometimes we're responding to things, but I think in light of that, we might want to be in a place where it's like, okay, look, if you're going to the planning commission and they can say on the front end, okay, this is likely to result in removal of meters. And that, that has X cost associated with it. Bingo. And so this is one of those, this was a condition of it. Of a, any of these people online, correct me if I'm wrong, but this was a condition of a traffic impact study where they needed the turn lane and to get the turn lane in because of the width of the roadway, it results in removal of parking meters. Now to add to the snowball, um, we're gonna be discussing curbside use in a very big, broad picture, not only at the end of this meeting, but in an upcoming meeting that Terry's gonna give us an update about. and. It goes back to the smart parking program that we've all been discussing. Um, so, Councilman, in your defense, maybe that legislation and the smart parking program all go hand in hand. And it's too big for just one six meter decision to make today. Oh, but yeah. I'm not saying that we need to tie this particular request to that, but I do. I mean, it, I think it it should prompt us to recognize that we haven't completed our our work on this overall initiative, but I don't, I don't hate the idea of um, taking that that smart approach um, and using it as an opportunity to make some of these updates. But you know, I also yes. need to hear, I need to hear what we're going to hear at the end of the meeting as well. Oh, thank yeah. you. Uh, I, I want to thank you all for answering my questions. I certainly defer to Chip and his knowledge, and and I, I would like for Public Works to be consulted as much as they can be because they know, you know, uh, Chip and, and has been, I mean, the, over the, the uh, knowledge, the depth of knowledge about all the pieces falling into place. And certainly Councilman O'Connell understands that. So I, I appreciate your answering the questions. If you all knew about this, then. So, so we have at least two people online and I see one with their hand up. Is there chair, Mr. Chair, if you want to call yes. on her. Well, I see a hand up for Betsy Williams, but I think it's been up for a while and so is yours, Chip. Is there anyone here from Reagan Smith? Hi, my name is Tiffany Girano and I'm the uh, traffic engineer that submitted this request for, for Reagan Smith. Okay, so Tiffany, can you 
provide us some insights into the plan here while we look at the map? Yes. Um, so on the east side of Overton, adjacent to the property 910 division, where we're requesting the majority of the removal, um, we have, we're requesting to remove those parking spaces so that we can get two access points so we can have our on-site circulation for this hotel and valet be on-site instead of queuing on Overton or Division. We wanted to be able to move those vehicles off of the public roadway and on site. So that is the reason for that. And then during our scoping meeting with Public Works, they wanted us to look into installing a southbound left turn to help the delay at the intersection. And with that left turn lane, we will have to remove that one parking meter. You can see it kind of represented by that black car right there um, to be able to get that left turn in there. That is the reason. And actually, um, I emailed Chip a little bit ago. My original request was a little off. So it's one parking space there. And then on the east side is actually six parking spaces between the alley and Division Street. And Mr. Chair, I think um, with this one in particular, understanding what Mr. Knopf has put out there, I mean, we, we know this one was as much as anything triggered by the overall context of the project, including the planning process. I, as the district representative for where this one is, I am perfectly content for this one to go ahead. But I think, um, you know, it, it is an, a great example of something that is um, a piece that was not specifically tied to valet, but is tied to the, the notion of meter removal and that being a reduction in revenue. Um, you know, for my part, I want to be clear that I'm prepared to support this request today. Um, I think the valet one, it, if I'm not mistaken, it will be the first brand new uh, valet application we've gotten since this discussion began. And so, you know, whether or not we take any action on that one might be more directly related to the, the valet specific updates we get today. But I'd, I'd perfectly, I'd be personally uh, content to, to see this one approved by the commission today. Is there any more discussion of this issue? I mean, uh, I just want to second that we've been discussing for several months since last fall curbside management and trying to get some movement towards some sense of a comprehensive program in this city. And I think this is an example of what we want to try to incorporate. Uh, so I think we just need to keep this example in mind as we move forward. With that, is there a motion to move this item forward, please? This is Council Member O'Connell. Yes. You made a motion to move forward. Hey, is there a second? This is Nora Kern. I'll second. Okay, we have a first and a second. Is there any further discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion passed. Thank you for a very good discussion, one and all. Okay, the next item is we're gonna have an update on the belay operations. And uh, Ms. Costonis, are you gonna be leading that? And is there anyone else? Because I think Mr. Hammond is out on vacation this week. Mr. Chair, are we? I, do we still need to take a vote on consent? I couldn't remember if we actually did that. We did that. Oh, we've already passed the consent. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you for keeping me straight, though. I appreciate it. Um, so, so this is Terry um, Costona. Um, uh, so we don't have, I think, um, a presentation for you to update you on ballet so much as a promise of one in future. Um, there is an initiative in the development stage with regard to not just ballet, but smart parking and like many other kind of 
curb uses um, and, and, and revenue related issues um, that are being looked at um, comprehensively. Um, and I believe that there are plans to make a presentation to the commission about that at next month's meeting. And so um, uh, the thought was rather than um, ad addressing valet um, or the future of valet um, in isolation, that, that we would reserve that for that larger discussion since it is a part of that picture. Um, however, if Diane has any more, you know, detailed factual information about the current state of things, um, I'm not sure if there's there's anything like that to present to you at this time. But definitely there is a, an initiative in the development stages that ties together a number of related activities in, um, uh, and like I said, it is anticipated that we would, not me specifically, but, but a, 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 I think a group of presenters would um, be prepared to um, give the commission more detailed information about that next month. Would, do you anticipate that there'd be something that the commission would need to vote on? Something that we would be approving? A change in revenue structure, et cetera, process? At the August meeting, you mean? Yes, ma'am. Um, no, I, I think that would just be an informational meeting about things to come in future. I don't think we're quite that ahead of it at this stage. But I, I also, you know, Chip has some knowledge about this. Mary Beth Eichert is on the, the call from the mayor's office. Um, and like I said, I, I, I don't know if Diane has like kind of current factual um, information about ballet operations, um, but I, I certainly would defer to all of them. <laughs> okay. Ms. Eichert, do you have anything to add concerning things that may be coming down the pike from the mayor's office? concerning curbside management? Yeah, so um, to run this pilot that we have with um, a company called Cord, um, and some, some of y'all might know about this, some of y'all might not. Um, it was announced nationally, but we haven't done a local announcement on it yet. But we are we're running a pilot project with them where we are gonna be experimenting with um, a, a pay to play framework on um, delivery loading and unloading in a few locations downtown where we have problems with double parking and multiple conflicts for access of use of the curb, um, difficulty for musician loading and that sort of thing. And uh, this is something that's been recommended before, but we've never really um, had anything to to, to run with. And so this is basically going to be a pilot program where we're experimenting with this using their technology. They have an app um, where, uh, you know, we'll reach out to delivery services and ask drivers to essentially make a fee based reservation for these, what are they're going to be called smart loading zones. Um, but to run this pilot and, you know, um, have a way to efficiently um, succeed, fail, tweak, uh, move things around if we need to. Um, we're gonna delegate some authorities to the Traffic and Parking Commission so that as we're running the pilot, we don't have to keep going back to council for every single thing that we need to do to run that. Um, and we have filed a draft ordinance. It'll need to be three readings. Um, and Terry and I under other business can pull up um, that language so that you can see it. Um, and I think what will happen is um, it'll get uh, referred back to you all for that August meeting for a recommendation to, to the council. Um, but right now it's just been filed and we're anticipating a, a deferral at that July 21st meeting. so that y'all can look at it. All right, well, thank you for that update. Uh, yeah, I can I can say more. I just don't want to hijack your agenda. So you no, know. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, we have an item here in front of us uh, of an approval for a valet stand, but I think that we're, 
I don't know, not speaking for everyone, but still somewhat operating in the dark about what our new program is. Uh, and trying to figure out exactly, you know, how do we approve things coming to us uh, without really knowing all the particulars of our program. Uh, fellow commissioners, is that somewhat accurate of where we are? Yeah, I think so. This is Nora, and I think we had expressed in past meetings just a general concern in moving forward on new applications. Well, for valet specifically, since we were hoping to update the fee structure, um, both for the removal, but also for um, removal of meters, but for also for the general operations of LA. So I don't know, I guess, yeah, I'm still a little confused if that is coming or if that's something we should wait for, um, because it does, seem like it could make sense to delay valets until we get the new updated fee structure, but I don't know if that's still six months off or, or what. So that's kind of what I'm wondering. Miss Williams, your hand is up. Betsy? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I think that, um, until we get this report and we have some direction on this and information that we don't need to have ballet request come before us until this information has been presented. Okay. So, Ms. Costonis, the change, is it a... I think we discussed increasing the fees as part of our study. Does that require commission approval? I guess that's what my question is. So um, any um, change in any fees that are set out in the Metro code will um, require council approval. And then any council legislation that has an effect on traffic is a mandatory referral to the traffic and parking commission. So I, I would think if the fees are parking related, um, that they would have an effect on traffic and that they would need to come before the commission, yes. Right. 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 I think Mr. Chair, my understanding would be that it would work like some of the other things that happen just that, I mean, again, it's a, I think it's a question of where it might originate, but mm -hmm. you know, frequently matters that come to council come with a, a recommendation from the commission. Um, and so this, this I think would be similar where we would have a bill that got administratively filed. Um, but in that, uh, filing process, it would get referred to the commission and then ultimately come to the council where we would have at least two committees very likely review it. Okay. All right. Well, because I think there's been an overall view expressed by commissioners over many months of a change in the valet program, including changes in the fee structure. And I guess we're kind of waiting to get something presented to us so we can <laughs> act upon it. Well, and that's maybe my confusion, Mr. Chair, is I thought that based on the agenda, that was going to be where we were today. I, I had been expecting something along the lines of a fee study. Yes. Okay. So, so to backtrack, I agree, I agree with you, Mr. O'Connor. I'm thinking that we've been bouncing this issue around for several months, and I think we're ready. I think the commissioners are ready to actually have a plan presented to us that we can vote upon. I think that's where we are. Fellow commissioners, please chime in. I, I, I agree. I just don't know what's involved. Is this something that uh, I guess I would defer to, to Chip and Diane? Is this something that has to be outsourced and we need time for or can you educate me? So we are currently doing our own in-house ballet study. And it quickly grew as the mayor's office, Mary Beth and her team started talking to court and started getting into smart parking and ATU's uh, loading zones. And so we 
we slowed down with the idea of why go change the ballet legislation when we may be changing loading zone legislation, parking meters, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I believe at the August meeting, we're going to have somebody from the mayor's office give us a brief presentation on the overall, I don't want to, it's not fair to say the overall parking program, but how this valet and this pool program and, and loading zones in general all go together. So yes, we are still doing a valet study and in fairness to you guys, I understand not taking action on an item until you see that study. When you'll see it, I don't know. I think it was House Member O'Connell that said six months or somebody said six months, it very well could be. But it is underway, but it has grown into something that is being managed by the mayor's office and we are helping them out. And it may very well involve consultants. That's why this pilot with poor is important because we're going to be collecting data along with it. Okay. Well, I, I guess my thought is concerning the item before us, the valet stand, is I still think we're, we do not have enough information to kind of move forward because we don't know where that valet stand stands in relative to the rest of curbside management. That's my observation. Commissioner, uh, Mr. Chair, this is Commissioner Woods. Could we postpone it a month and see what we're going to hear next month? and then see what we need to do? Well, and this might come back to that scenario that unfolded with the graduate, Mr. Chair, maybe, and maybe Diane can speak to this. Can we, can we move forward with a temporary valet permit until we get some more clarity around where this, this bigger picture might be? We have the option of issuing a temporary permit for this valet, and we can do it for a 30-day time period. So we can bring it back to the commission at next month's meeting if that's what you desire to do. Right. Ms. Woods, would you like to make a motion on this item, please? So what happens if we if we postpone this? Are they expecting a ballet to uh, today? I think they, they will operate on a temporary permit until we bring it back to the commission for final approval. Okay, then I vote that we postpone the vote on this project until it, we put it, defer it for a month. Okay, there's a motion to defer for a month. Is there a second? I second, this is Betsy. Okay. And the, let me just be clear, Mr. Chair, and I, yes. I think I understand uh, Commissioner Wood's motion, but are we saying we, will, we would not then issue a temporary valet? I think we would issue a temporary valet pending the approval of a permanent valet. Uh, any okay. kind of approval. I think we, so we're not gonna keep them from having a valet stand is my understanding. And with a temporary permit, that means no signs will be installed at that location for valet until the commission approves it. Okay. Okay. All right, so we have a first and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed, we've deferred this item. All right, I think the next item we wanted was to get an update on legislation for countywide speed limit reduction on local roadways. I think the plan was to reduce residential streets, whatever that definition is, from 30 to 25. Is there an update, Ms. Costonis? I do not have an update on that issue at this time. Um, Mr. Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll help you out. Okay. Mr. Mr. Chair, Derek is gonna present number three, okay. along with number two, all in one. Happy presentation. Okay. Well, that sounds wonderful. Mr. Haggerty, it sounds like you have the floor again. Oh, good afternoon. Thank you very much. I think it was the July meeting last year <laughs> when I was first appeared uh, before this committee to talk about our traffic calming program. And looking forward to do the same thing. Before I get into that, though, I will hit on the speed limit reduction. 
Um, Before you get going any further, Mr. Haggy, I think we should all congratulate you on becoming a father since the last <laughs> time you were before us. And yes. uh, so I would like to extend that congratulations to you. So thank you very much. It's been a lot of fun. All right. You can proceed now. I'll be quiet. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all right, thank you very much. So first off, the speed limit reduction. Uh, what we've done up to this point is commissioned a sign location countywide. We've had a contractor go out, identify every single sign, and they're in the process of classifying those. We, uh, we have pretty good records from about the past 12 years of what's out there and where it is. Before that though, it's, uh, little bit of a black hole. So this is really helping us fill in some gaps. Uh, they're in the process right now of identifying, they've, they've already gone out, captured all these images. Now they're going through and matching the type of sign to the image. There's some kind of computer learning involved. I'm not an ITS expert. I just know the basics. Once they've gone through, identified all these 30 mile an hour signs, we'll be able to map them. At that point, we're gonna figure out how we're actually gonna tackle switching these to 25 mile an hour signs. Right now, our thought process is we'll pick a central point, probably in the downtown area, and work in a spiral outwards. We're anticipating somewhere between four and 5,000 signs that are gonna to have to be swapped out, which is a little more than we can handle in-house. So we will uh, most likely be contracting that out. And we'll be grouping signs by area, talking with the contractor to finish to figure out what is a manageable number for one day. So we'll try to do sections at a time. Obviously with this number of signs, it's gonna take a while, but uh, we're hoping that by doing it section by section of the city, at least for neighborhoods, it'll appear pretty consistent. It will take some time. I'm sure there'll be a month there where uh, you know, people are having issues going in between neighborhoods, but signs should be pretty well marked. So to sum it all up, right now, we've gone out, collected the data. We're just shaping that into a useful form. Next step will actually be to order materials, get a contractor out there to start swapping out signs. Um, hi, this is Nora. Could you remind me, does it, this still need to be voted on by council and the commission or was the speed limit itself finalized? That I do not know. Um, I believe it's a part of, part of what Mr. Hager is referring to with the sign inventory is to gather a cost estimate for what we're talking about when it gets to council and before you guys. So to answer you, no, it has not been voted on. It will require change in legislation, change in the code, and back to the mandatory referral that you guys will get. But the, what he's talking about with the sign inventory is going to be a crucial part before you know how to vote. If it's going to cost a billion dollars, it might be differently than it's 10000 So that's what we're preparing right now. Got it. Thank you. Are there any other questions about where we're sitting on that before we move into traffic calming? Seat ahead, please. Thank you. All right, Corby, do you have the slide deck? I thank you, the host, Derek. So you uh, you don't have the presentation. You have to switch okay. back to the host. Yes, you have to switch back to the host. Yep, I got it. All right, can everyone see the screen? Yep. All right, perfect. So just really quickly, I wanna hit on what traffic calming is, what our program looks like. I covered all this last time, but then I really wanna get into what we've done up to this point, where our program is sitting, some of the changes we've made and some of the challenges we're facing. I'll probably go through this in about five, 10 minutes, and then please let me know what questions you have at the end. So first off, what is traffic calming? Simply, it's physical measures to reduce traffic speeds. Anything from signage and pavement markings up to traffic circles, speed humps, and everything in between. All these pictures you see here have been taken around Nashville. And um, 
that we're definitely seeing a lot more on the rise. There's quite a few neighborhoods when you can find examples of these around town. So neighborhood traffic calming program. This program was really revamped in 2019 to focus on physical solutions in our residential neighborhoods and really aimed at reducing speeds of cut through traffic. So we've instituted a twice yearly application period. We're in the middle of one of those application periods right now. They're generally about three weeks long, one in January, one in July. The reason we do this is to really help center our data collection efforts. After we collect these applications, we go out, get all the data at once. Easier to do for us, keeps us focused one on one thing at a time. Now, if an application comes in in March, we're not gonna tell the person, hey, you have to hold on to this. We're still gonna accept it. It's just gonna sit there for three or four months before we do anything with it. Um, we've instituted a data-driven selection criteria. I'll cover our prioritization model next. And we've really focused on working with neighborhoods for solutions that work for them. Prior to this revamp, we did a few physical traffic calming projects. Um, a lot of them that went in came back out. Part of the reason for this is we didn't have complete neighborhood support. You know, a lot of the times at Public Works, it's probably the same for the commission. When you have four or five people from a street come out, tell you, you know, we have this problem, we need this solution. That sounds like a lot. That sounds like it's the entire street in favor of it. With some of these larger measures, uh, traffic circles, chicanes, speed humps, not always the case. I think what we found is a lot of people recognize there's a speeding issue, but they maybe don't wanna to jump to that most extreme measure. So with every single neighborhood, we have at least one community meeting. Most we have two to three, and we've had five or six in some, which you know, it's great. The more time people can spend on these projects, our results we've had. Um, we've selected 16 neighborhoods last year. We have 12 of them at least partially installed at this point and zero complaints from the actual neighbors. Some of that cut through traffic, we get a little pushback, but that's all right. That doesn't bother us too much. All right, so our application, like I said, right now we're in the application window. It runs to the 24th. Uh, it's available on our Public Works website. Also, if people ever have speeding issues, they can report through Hub Nashville. Anything speeding related generally comes to me and I'll direct them to this program, get them the application. Application, it's four pages, but it's really not that much information we're asking for. One is just contact information. Uh, page two, we're asking them to prioritize the streets. Uh, and this really impacts what streets we conduct the studies on. I'll get to the model in a second here, but a lot of what we're doing is just pulling information off our computer systems. We are going out and doing physical speed measures as well. And we're just limited both on funding, personnel equipment on how many of these we can do. So general, generally with neighborhoods, we'll pick just the first or second. Someone lists four streets, which a lot of neighborhoods do. We just don't always have uh, you know, the resources to conduct that speed study on every single one. The third page, we're just asking about the traffic issues. The reason we do this, there's, a, there's two reasons behind it. One gives us an idea of what we're facing before we go into that first neighborhood meeting so we can kind of get on the same page with the neighbors. Number two, we can look for things that can be done outside of this program. Uh, parking issues pop up a lot so we can refer those to Diane Marshall and sometimes those make it to the committee as well. We also see a lot of signage, pavement markings, things that can be tackled outside of this program. Finally, last page is a program agreement, which basically just saying they're not gonna yell at me during a meeting, which uh, works so-so. All right, so our prioritization model, 100 point system we use, 40 points of that is a crash history. We pull these directly from the police department we look at all crashes on the streets within the last five years. We break that down per mile to standardize across neighborhood. Next up is measured speeds. We go out, we lay pneumatic tubes. Uh, we try to do these in the middle of the week during the school year. 
during dry weather to make it as consistent as possible neighborhood versus neighborhood. Then we compare this to the posted speed limit. Next up, neighborhood destination, 15 points. This is, we're looking at pedestrian generators within the area of the neighborhood. And what we're looking here is generally schools, parks, libraries. We generally limit to public locations. One, because we already have a GIS file, very easy to pull into our model. And two, we, with, with 100 plus applications, we don't wanna be in the business of necessarily determining is every single thing a pedestrian generator. A lot are, we keep it with the public uh, locations. And finally, active transportation. This is a pretty broad category. Essentially anything that either forces or encourages pedestrians to go into the right of way. So here neighborhoods get points for things like lack of sidewalks, or on the flip side, do you have bus stops where people are waiting near the street? Are there bike lanes unprotected? Things of that nature. Finally, I just wanna make this point here. You can tell it's important, I put an exclamation mark after it. The model is relative. So we base all this off of the neighborhood scores. So whichever neighborhood has the highest crash score, let's say that's 100 crashes per mile, that neighborhood gets 40 points. Uh, let's say your neighborhood has 50 crashes per mile. These are also extremely high numbers. No neighborhood in Nashville is this high. You would get 50 points. If we we're able to do a project in that first neighborhood, the 100 crash one, the next year, let's say that 50 uh, crash is the highest, that'll be that standard for 40 points. So this does skew the model every six months as we have new neighborhoods coming in and going out. We think it's the best way to compare neighborhoods against each other. I'm gonna get into the numbers of the applications we have here. And you're gonna see, you know, really the demand is outpacing our funding level at the moment. So this prioritization model, you know, we like it because it's not too resource intensive. We're able to keep most of the funding going into the neighborhoods and it still gives us a way to measure. I mean, realistically, we have about 130 neighborhoods right now this model is great if your neighborhood is the one picked. Um, outside of that, you know, it's not a perfect model, but it's a good starting point. Helps us at least, uh, you know, group neighborhoods together. All right, so what's new to this program? Since I talked to uh, everyone last, we do have a materials contract in place. This is for a lot of the uh, rubber products we use, speed cushions, speed tables, our speed radar signs are included in this. And this has brought down our materials cost 17% in this program by getting this bulk contract in place. Uh, it's also cut out a lot of work on my end. You've never dealt with Metro's uh, procurement process before. It can be time consuming. So this is great. I just get my order, send it in, fantastic. We've also introduced an online petition option. ITS is currently setting up uh, our own website. For now, we're just using a free public website, SurveyMonkey. This allows neighborhoods to send this out if they have an email list. Uh, it just helps make it easier than going door to door. We do require, before we install any vertical measures, so something like speed cushions, traffic circles, anything that's really gonna affect all drivers on the street, we do require that 70% of residences approve. Uh, we think this has really been key to having the neighborhood feel like this is their project. They've spoken out in favor of it. It does require a little footwork, but so far we haven't had any neighbors, neighborhoods that have not been able to complete it. Uh, and then our final thing, which we haven't rolled out yet, but we will during our next round of selections, is changing up how we do the initial neighborhood presentation. In the past, we've really gone in with a blank slate, said, hey, here are all the options. This is your street. This is the data we have. Let's start from scratch. Um, it's been great. We get a lot of neighborhood involvement, but we also start with some kind of patchwork projects. So going in, we're going to moving forward, we're gonna come in with a baseline idea, just us looking at the map, be very clear with the neighborhood. This is not 
absolutely what we're doing, but we want a starting point. And we've identified a few different methods that really work well. Speed cushions, very popular, similar to speed humps. They have gaps in the middle to allow vehicles with large wheelbases to go through fire trucks, ambulances, vehicles of that nature. Um, narrowing the street is great. We're able to get enough room for a pedestrian path. Very popular, you know, way of doing a sidewalk like structure on the cheap. Speed radar signs also very popular. So that's kind of what's changed in the past year. Uh, just looking back, we selected 16 neighborhoods last year, eight in March, eight in October. 11 of them are complete. A uh, couple of those are pending a phase two. We're waiting on some paving to take place. We do have two that are currently under construction. Last year when I was here, we had a gentleman from Stokes Lane speak. We just finished paving Stokes, so the end of this week, we're going to start on the traffic calming project, which will be great. Uh, we do have two neighborhoods in the petition process and one that is still in the planning phase. Uh, first neighborhood we've met where neighbors aren't too sure if they want to go with some of these measures. So we'll see how this one plays out. It's interesting. Um, ultimately, we're not going to force something on them if the majority of the neighborhood doesn't want it. All right, so program status. From last January, we have rolled over 105 applications. Uh, that's how many we had on file going into this July period. Last March, we identified 14 neighborhoods for selection. Um, however, it was right when the tornado hit, right when the COVID pandemic popped off. So we have not yet announced those. Um, there's some budget issues that are being worked out before those announcements are made, but we do have a list of neighborhoods ready to go. And just to build on that, I will say this current application period, we've received 29 new applications so far. Some of those um, are similar to ones we've received in the past. Our total number now is about 125, but we still have two weeks to go. So looking at some of the challenges, number one, how do we hold public meetings moving forward? Um, yeah, metro-wide challenge. We've seen the planning department do some great things. Virtual seems to be one of the ways to go. You know, unfortunately, we can't reach everyone that way. So we're looking to match that with a flyer program, essentially dropping flyers in mailboxes with the plans, asking residents to call us directly. But right now, we haven't rolled out either of these just too much. Most of the projects we have now, we've already had our initial one or two public meetings. So we're just finalizing some things, hasn't been an issue. Once we select new neighborhoods though, it'll, uh, I'm sure I'm gonna learn a lot about running these meetings under the new conditions. Other challenges, labor costs. Um, this is really one of the largest costs we see. No different from the rest of Metro projects. The speed cushions we buy, um, if you've never seen these, they're six feet wide, seven and a half feet long. Depending on the width of the road, we need to put two to four of them down to make it all the way across. We always do these in sets. So you'll see sets of two, three, four, five. One of these speed cushions cost us $625 made out of recycled tires. The labor cost to install one is $750. Now, it's a lot of work. There's generally a crew of about four or five personnel out there. Each individual cushion takes 120 volts and there's an epoxy involved. So the crews we have now, they can get down maybe eight to 10 in a day but uh, the labor costs are definitely one of the major costs we're seeing on the project side, which is probably not too surprising. Also, the speed data collections. Just with the sheer number of neighborhoods, uh, number one, we don't collect speed data in-house right now. Number two, if we did, we just wouldn't be able to do this many um, with the personnel and equipment requirements. So we contract this out as well. The collection... And Corby, if I'm way off here, let me know. Costs anywhere from a few hundred dollars up to about a thousand, depending on the size of the street, safety factors. Now, because these are residential streets, 
we're probably closer to the four or $500 range, not near that thousand dollar number. But when we're out collecting 50, 60, 70 streets, uh, it adds up pretty quick. But we do think having this data is very important, not only for this program, but we also have a great baseline of data for once we do this speed limit changeover, drop in the speeds, we'll really be able to have, we'll have a great before picture. We can follow it up, see what the effect of that, that change is. So that concludes what I have prepared here. I just want to open it up for questions now and uh, see if I can answer any that you have. Thank you, Derek. Betsy Williams, your hand is up. <laughs> um, so Derek, how many of these have you implemented to date in total? Yep, so to date we've implemented 12 of the 16 we've selected and we'll have two more complete by the end of next week. So we'll be up to 14. And any kind of feedback, or I guess that's still part of the loop, isn't it? Yeah, no, so the feed, so we have two ways of collecting feedback. We have we go back out, collect speed data six months after a project's installed, you know, give traffic patterns a chance to normalize across the board, low, lower speeds, no surprise there. And then I get anecdotal neighborhood feedback I would say from the actual residents of the street, the feedback has been 99% positive. I do attribute that to the outreach we do. These projects do not surprise anyone. Neighbors know that they're coming, they're involved in the process. And really also just because of the sheer number of neighborhoods that we've select, that we've had apply, you know, we've been selecting the ones that have the highest speeds, the highest crash rates, so these people, you know, undoubtedly have issues. I could see in four or five years, as we work our way down this list, where maybe speeds are a little higher, you know, you, you get some crashes, there's gonna be a little more neighbor pushback and that's okay. You know, if we're not gonna put in measures that people don't want, but we've been really dealing with some dangerous streets. So it's very little pushback. Occasionally from, uh, I think, people that are used to driving through the neighborhoods at a fairly high pace, we hear something, but you know, those are the people we want to not be happy with this. Thank you. Commissioners, any other comments, input? Hi, Derek, this is Nora. Um, I just had a quick question about budget moving forward. So. Um, you're opening up the application now. Do you know how much funding you have for um, new neighborhoods beyond the ones that were already selected in March um, for this upcoming fiscal year? Yeah, great question. So right now, we're not sure how many we're gonna be selecting moving forward. We're also not even sure when we're gonna be collecting this next round of data. Like I mentioned earlier, we like to do it in the middle of the week during the school year to get fair, a fair comparison across the board. With the way traffic patterns have been lately, it's, it's gonna be, we, we have a little bit of a challenge on how we're gonna collect these new neighborhoods and compare them fairly to the ones that are already in the program. You know, we recognize traffic patterns are, while they're coming back to normal, it's still, still a little different. Um, our hope is to you know, have some budget clarity in the next few weeks, but I'm not crossing my fingers or anything, but it, we are in a little bit in the dark moving forward. We're collecting the applications now to stay consistent, but we do not know when the ne that next data collection is gonna happen or when our next round of neighborhoods are gonna be announced. So you have funding for the ones that you selected in March? or the ones that were about to be announced when everything hit? We did in March. Um, whether that's still available right this minute is what's being sorted out. I think we reckon Public Works had, uh, you know, 
some obviously some added expenses with the tornado that we're expecting to be reimbursed. But until we have clarity on when that's going to happen, we're holding off on announcing those new projects. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Any, any other comments? Well, well, thank you, Mr. Haggerty. That was very informative. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. And you know, if commissioners ever have questions, just please let me know. Okay. All right. The, the last item we want to discuss is actually an item that's not on the agenda, but we have some uh, folks from Vanderbilt University that want to discuss some, I guess, ideas about ideas about how they're going to use the street, use the street, COVID nineteen, COVID -19, -19 to keep people safe, keep people safe, safe distancing, distancing. So we'll let so we'll let them proceed. Proceed. Thank All you. All right, Mr. Chairman. Um, Traffic and Parking Commissioners, Councilman O'Connell, thank you for allowing us to come before you to share a few items on social distancing and street modifications on Vanderbilt University's campus. And we're using this time as a quick go over of these modifications. And of course, we welcome your thoughts. Joining me are my two Vanderbilt University colleagues, um, Aaron Hattenshill, Executive Director of Mobility and Transportation, and Michael Briggs, Assistant Director of Mobility. I, I think I forgot to introduce myself. I'm, I'm Alfred de Graff and I'm the Associate Vice Chancellor for Local Government and, and Community Relations, but we're here to um, provide an update for you. So at this time, I'll turn it over to um, Aaron. Uh, there we go. Hi, everyone. I'm Erin Hafkinshiel. Thanks, Alfred, so much. And thank you so much for the opportunity to come share this with you. As Alfred said, I'm Executive Director of Mobility and Transportation at Vanderbilt University. And um, we are uh, one of the big programs that we're working on is called the Move You program, which is our effort to reduce our drive alone commute rates to campus. Um, and actually to reduce our drive alone rate from 76.5% to 55% um, is an effort to improve our local air quality and also reduce congestion in the Midtown area as well as the entire region, um, Nashville region. One of the other things we've been working on obviously over the last few months is how to reopen campus amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I'm participating in Vanderbilt Circulate COVID-19 Circulation Committee, which is looking at how we are going to have students, faculty, and staff back on campus, navigating our buildings and navigating our campus pathways. Um, and as you guys may be familiar, we are obviously co-located with the University Medical Center and combined before COVID-19, we had about 55,000 people on campus every day. Um, and so while we anticipate a lower volume of folks back on campus this fall. It definitely is a huge number of people who come to campus um, every day. And since our undergrads will be back on campus, there's a lot of activity. Um, as part of that circulation effort, we identified three locations on campus that were going to be particularly difficult to maintain our social distancing standards. Um, even prior to the um, face, face mask mandate, we were mandating face masks on campus. Um, as well as, as uh, maintaining six feet of social distancing. So um, we've been working with the, the folks at Public Works on um, these requests for street modifications and um, wanted to share those three requests with you today. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Michael Briggs, um, our assistant director, who's gonna walk through the three um, requests. Hey there, I'm Michael Briggs, uh, Assistant Director of Mobility um, at Vanderbilt. Um, I think I've got the ability to share. I'll get that on your screen. Um, so we have three locations where we are looking um, to do street modifications. Um, it will help uh, in instances where uh, we have students, faculty, and staff encountering each other trying to get to campus um, to allow for a little more space uh, to social distance. Um, the first area 
actually will not require action from what we understand from the traffic and parking commission i wanted to get these in front of you to help set the context of what we're doing um and then also um just discuss any issues that you all may want to address before uh, proceeding forward with more fleshed out um, ideas. So the first one is on Edge Hill Avenue uh, between 21st Avenue and 18th Avenue. Um, it currently has a bike lane starting in the area around the Magnolia Lawn over to 18th Avenue. We're wanting to make it a protected bike lane, um, either with traffic cones or delineators that uh, will allow uh, people who are walking in this area uh, to step into space and step into that space and socially distance. Yeah. The, this gives you the existing conditions that are at the intersection. Um, the sidewalk on the south side of Edge Hill is uh, four to five feet wide and it oftentimes has power poles or signs that are in it. Um, and we're trying to work towards um, Sorry, um, the the adding traffic or temporary delineators on the bike lane stripe right here. So you don't see that here at the intersection, but just um, east up over this hill um, is the bike lane. Um, and we think this will allow people, um, you can see in this example, um, they're kind of crowded. Um, we'll give more space for uh, bicyclists and for people walking in this area. The uh, second area is a terrace place. Um, zoom back out. Um, and it's near one of our uh, administration buildings called the Baker Building. Uh, so this is 21st Avenue, um, and this is a terrace place here. Um, it does, uh, the proposal would impact uh, three metered parking spaces on the south side here at Terrace Place. Um, and what we're trying to do here is extend the sidewalk uh, because the building is directly adjacent to the sidewalk and there's about eight feet here of sidewalk um, to give space for people to step into the socially distance. Um, this is the existing conditions today. Um, so it's um, uh, adjusting um, some of the lineage here and the uh, parking spaces on the south side of Terrace Place. Um, and we've got it highlighted here because we have some options because there is a loading zone on the north side of Terrace Place uh, to where we can provide the loading over on a parking lot and lot 5A of our campus if we need to, or we can continue to work through uh, with your traffic engineers as to how to adjust uh, that loading zone space as well that's on the north side. So it's not really clear from the photo here that there's a loading space, but there is um, one space that's marked out here on the north side. Then our third location is a, a larger area and it's between um, Natchez Trace and 24th Avenue South um, and it's just Neely Drive and Highland Avenue. Um, and if you are familiar with this area by the football uh, stadium and the, the baseball field, uh, there's on-street parking that's metered on the north side. Uh, there's 28 spaces here. Um, and it's similar to the issue at, uh, in front of the Baker building. Um, the football field has uh, elements of the stadium that come up very close to the sidewalk. Um, and so in this area, we're trying to allow for more space, uh, again, for bicyclists and people to uh, step off into an area that's a little bit protected um, and socially distance themselves. Similar issue on the Highland Avenue portion, except there is no on-street parking in this area here. Um, and it uh, would be simply coning off one of the lanes and making the center turn lane um, a through lane um, in this area. This is the existing conditions in front of uh, Jess Neely by the, the football stadium. You can see the, the stadium elements come right to the back of the sidewalk. Um, and so to socially distance in this area is pretty difficult with cars that are parked through here. Uh, so we'd be trying to cone off uh, the parking lane um, and adjust the on-street parking in this area uh, to add a shared path for people to either walk or bike um, in this area. 
And looking at um, Highland Drive, so this is at the intersection here, um, it would be uh, utilizing this uh, through lane and shifting the through lane into the center lane. Um, so removing this lane, designating it a, a travel return lane and adding cones. So it's just continuing the condition uh, from Natchez Trace over to 24th um, Avenue. So we wanted to bring these uh, to you because we know it impacts uh, metered parking um, and get your thoughts on that since that is uh, something that the Traffic and Parking Commission will ultimately have to um, make a decision on as to whether or not to remove uh, those spaces. Um, and one thing that Aaron um, uh, also uh, we should mention is that um, the movie you plan um, and the future VU plans, which are the campus uh, land use and transportation plans, have looked at these areas and are trying to make them more pedestrian friendly. And uh, these align really well also with uh, bicycle facilities that are identified as part of those plans. Um, and then they also connect in with the city's uh, major and collector street plan and bike plan as well. And so we're trying to kind of put all these pieces together on Vanderbilt's campus and get the scene uh, between uh, where the university ends and begins and where the city's uh, public right of way ends and begins, uh, kind of better aligned around some of these facilities to test out. Mr. Chair, this is Councilmember O'Connell. Uh, two of those three locations are within District 19, and I, I will say, um, having spent years dropping off uh, one uh, or the other daughter at Vanderbilt's Child and Family Center on Edge Hill Avenue. I saw cyclists there all the time. Um, and I think this would be a significant improvement um, to that corridor for access to and from campus. I mean, it is a heavily traveled uh, cycling corridor, so I can speak direct to that one. Um, and then again, the, the Terrace Place location, I think, in advance of a major uh, project that Vanderbilt is developing um, just around the corner, I think is going to be, um, again, uh, a significant improvement to that corridor. So as, as someone who can speak from a district perspective to two out of those three, I'm, I'm very supportive of what uh, Vanderbilt's looking at here. Uh, question, I, I was thinking Chess Neely was a quote unquote private street, Vanderbilt control, are the parking meter spaces Metro or Vanderbilt? The parking meters are Metro. Okay, because there are some parking meters in and around campus that are Vanderbilt. There are some parking meters that are there, there are a few streets that have um, that have parking meters on them that that are Vanderbilt owned. I um, like uh, Garland Avenue is is an example of that. But the vast majority of parking meters within um, sort of Vanderbilt's footprint are on Metro on streets, and thus are Metro parking meters. Okay, well, thank you for the clarification. So, would all the meters go away on Chess Neely if this plan was implemented? Is that correct? Well, one thing that we have discussed and, and we, are, we are willing to um, bring up is that we, we, we could potentially um, relocate them to another, to an, one thing we forgot to mention is that, you know, we are proposing this as sort of a six month pilot. Um, and, and so we would only have these changes in place for sort of this fall semester. And then we could decide if we are still in <laughs> this COVID-19 crisis, um, you know, we could decide to extend it for the spring. And so in terms of, um, whether to replace the parking meters, I think we were, we're open to your thoughts. We could identify another street within Vanderbilt's perm, within Vanderbilt's footprint that has on-street parking spaces but doesn't have meters on them. Um, and and um, I think when we were having conversations with Public Works, we wouldn't necessarily want to remove the parking meters in these locations. We would probably just bag them temporarily um, in case so we have the opportunity of unbagging them in the future. Um, but we could we could entertain, you know, installing additional parking meters on, on another street within Vanderbilt's footprint um, if that was of interest. 
in regards to bagging the meters, we can bag the meters, no parking, similar to what we do anytime there's a baseball game or a special event at Vanderbilt, we bag them, no parking. Right. So that is an option. So is, is the request here for, is the Traffic and Parking Commission being asked to make a approval of a request? Is that correct, Mr. Knopf, Ms. Costanos? Not at this time. This is an FYI. Okay. Uh, this is an FYI as you drive around campus, if you happen to drive through there, so you'll at least be familiar with what we're doing. And okay. should it become permanent, um, then it will come in as an action item. Okay. I mean, Whatever I could, it happens to be. I would think the question to ask is what's been asked previously about other meters is how much revenue is being for, foregone what, during this test and what happens? I'll defer to Diane on that. Um, I, I will say it's a, it's a very delicate time and I agree with where you're going with this, but I also see Vanderbilt's intentions as well. Diane, oh, you got some guess on I, revenue? Yeah, I understand. Well, I'm trying that. to run numbers now to see what I can come up with. Yeah. Gonna be approximately five thousand annually, and that's a rough estimate. Okay. All right. Can any other commissioners' thoughts, ideas? I mean, I'm all for exploitation. And you know, this is the world has changed. Yeah, this is Nora. I agree. I mean, I think it definitely makes a lot of sense in the short term from a, a COVID-19 distancing perspective, but also as a chance to try this out. Right. I do think if in six months, if they're if they're closed, if they're taken out permanently and you know, expanded sidewalks or something are in the works, I think looking at other streets or I think we can approach it then, but I think in the short term, it makes a lot of sense. Well, it seems like this could be a model for some other parts of town where we have a lot of traffic, tourist uh, areas, et cetera, where I think we have similar characteristics. Is that correct, Mr. You were cutting out. I think you called my name, Chair. Uh, yeah, if Belmont were to call or Randy Lipscomb, whoever, were to call in and say, we would like to try something similar, uh, Michael and Aaron came in with a very detailed plan and we'd ask the other schools to do the same. All right, so I'm gathering that there's no, you know, what we just would like. Um, I'm going to say Aaron, I can't pronounce your last name, Aaron. Uh, fanatics is not my strong suit. But I guess what we would ask is six months from now, you know, January, approximately 2021, you come back to us and give us feedback on how your test went and, uh, and what your, uh, consideration going forward and you know the world will it's, it's a lot in it'll change a lot in six um yes thank you chairman that that sounds like a great plan and and we would be happy to come back and and report on um on on our progress what is the projected start date for this plan um, our students, our students come back. Um, our, our classes start on August 25th. So our hope would that they would be sort of up and running by then, if not sort of the you know week week a couple days or a week before that. Um, we are doing a modified move in this year, um, as you may know if you live around campus. We we try and usually do that in a in one day, which is a bit of a feat to pull off and. We are spreading it out over um, over a week period. So, if it would be possible to get it in the week before classes start, um, to to accommodate the folks on campus doing move-ins, um, that would be preferred. And but we, we can work with Public Works on a on a more definite timeline. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. So we'll look forward to getting uh, results and feedback, and hope that everybody stays safe. All right. Is there any other conversations, questions, concern? I think this was the last item on our agenda. Is there a motion to adjourn? Hey, Mr. Chair, can you read that last 
statement on the agenda or I will about our meeting next month. Yes, the next meet, meeting is Monday, August the 10th at a place to be determined. We've got a lot going on in this city and we're, we're gonna have it at our location to be determined. Yes, so we'll- uh, right. we'll It's get probably gonna be virtual. On Chuck, items we discussed. Admit it, I have a question. Does that mean we'll be virtual or not? It'll most likely be virtual, but in case not, it won't be at Lance and it won't be at Howard. So most likely it'll, it'll be online. Uh, I'd like to request, you know, in, the, in lieu of our numbers, that we try to stay virtual if at all possible. Noted. Noted. Okay. Is there a motion to adjourn? Chip, this is Mary Beth. I think Terry and I needed to provide an update. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. I was looking for other comments. Please proceed, Ms. Eichert. And... <laughs> no worries. Um, we just wanted to let you know that we have um, legislation at council to help us run the CORD pilot program. Um, this is something that uh, we won as a, a competition through Transportation for America. And we're in a cohort of um, uh, four cities, including Aspen, Colorado, Omaha, Nebraska, West Palm Beach, Florida. A company called CORD. And essentially what we'll be doing is running a temporary smart zone downtown in partnership with CORD um, to try and dip our toe into a pay to play policy framework, starting with targeting at delivery vehicles. We um, had discussed ride hail given the amount of ride hail traffic in the downtown area, but uh, with COVID-19, um, Cord felt like that wouldn't be a very good uh, approach at this time, uh, just due to the impacts on ride hail because of the pandemic. Um, but just due to, uh, increased competition on uses of the curb for everything from delivery, ride hail, um, shared micro mobility, bike lanes, and um, space for things like parklets. Um, this is essentially a, a way to run a good experiment on, on, on a pay to play framework for delivery. So uh, the goal is to increase compliance with Metro's loading regulations. Um, improve traffic flow where we're having people double park out in the lane of travel, um, causing some safety issues with that, accommodate increased uh, needs for accessing the curb, inform a curb management study that Metro uh, would like to pursue in the future, collect data. This is an app-based program, so there's uh, a strong data component, component, one of which will be getting a good inventory of our curb downtown and then capture the true cost of Metro provided services for um, having having delivery space for uh, private entities to use um, in the right way and uh, hopefully getting a better idea of the value of that space. Um, so we don't really have a project scope yet at this time. We have a kickoff meeting for the internal team tomorrow just to get started and talk about that. Uh, but we have a resolution for accompanying the contract at council that is essentially running the agreement with Metro as a grant, since, since this is an in-kind service that uh, the company is providing under a pilot temporary framework. And then um, we had to uh, go about changing some language in the code in order to um, get, get at what the uh, company was really looking at having us doing and this is I think going to be a net positive for Metro I think um, this is you know something we we looked at under the, um, the parking study um, that a lot of you all discussed last term um, but essentially it's going to turn over um, some authorities to run a curb management um, program to traffic and parking commission to help us uh, with the framework once we have it laid out. So Terry, do you want to um, just go over the legal changes for them real quick? I think you're muted. I think I muted myself when I meant to unmute myself. Sorry about that. Um, so this program is actually going to involve two pieces of legislation, one of which will not come before this commission, um, the other of which will be a mandatory referral to the commission. Um, the first piece of legislation was just a grant agreement that in order for us to be able to use CORD's app um, 
uh, they, um, as, as a result of this um, uh, contest that they did and everything, have agreed to allow us to use their technology um, as, as kind of an in-kind grant. Um, and so um, that first piece of legislation is just a resolution that we expect to go before council on um, uh, July 21. Um, it just um, kind of it, on Metro's behalf accepts towards in-kind grant of the permission to use their technology. Um, the second piece of it um, is what Mary Beth was describing. Um, so um, because their technology involves um, the pay to play and um, uh, the um, uh, kind of use of a, a loading zone for um, kind of exclusive purposes of the people who are um, uh, registered with the program and who make reservations to use that space, um, which is kind of inconsistent with how we do our loading zones now. Usually they're, um, you know, first come, first serve. Um, uh, that, um, uh, that, that those things need to be changed in the existing Metro code, that we need to um, have um, some ability to be flexible about fee provisions and we need to um, uh, explain that there are now going to be um, certain specially designated um, loading zone areas that are um, uh, that are subject to um, more exclusive use. Um, and so, um, so those two changes are made in this upcoming ordinance, and that ordinance will be a mandatory referral to this commission because um, the um, the ordinance does, as Mary Beth said, um, delegate to this commission um, the ability to set those fees. Um, um, and to, to have some other aspects of control over this program as well. Um, so um, that is something that you will be asked to vote on in August. So we wanted to go ahead and give you a heads up about it. All I would ask is that whatever proposals we're gonna be asked to vote on, if we, we can make sure we get them to the commissioners at least a week in advance so they have had a chance to study them and can direct any questions to the appropriate folks. That would be wonderful. I mean, it is um, like a mandatory referral piece of legislation like we often have on our agendas. Um, so I don't know if um, um, maybe like Mary or Chip or Diane would be able to say that like, does the legislation, I mean, the legislation has been filed, so it's out there, it's a public record. Um, whether that um, kind of goes out to the commissioners, um, I mean, we can certainly send it out additionally, but does that automatically go out to the commissioners when you have a mandatory referral? And I will on this one as well. Okay. All right, that'd be good. All right, is there anything else? Ms. Eichert, Ms. That's all, we'll, uh, we'll uh, bring it back to you in August for more okay. discussion, so. All right. All right, so we've had a, a long but informative meeting today. So all that being said, is there a motion to adjourn? I will make a motion that we adjourn. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 The ayes have it. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.org.